The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. The local broadcast of Prairie Sportsman is made possible in part by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Econar, producing geothermal heat pumps in Minnesota for over a quarter of a century. Econar, the leader of cold climate heat pump technology. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Closed captioning for Prairie Sportsman has been provided by the Sertoma Clubs of Alexandria, Brainerd Area, and Wilmer, assisting people with hearing health issues and providing a service to mankind. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Hi, Rich Massey here for Prairie Sportsman. You know, we're always rambling around in the outdoors looking for unusual things. Things that you never expect to find. Let's see what we've got for you this week. We visit Brookings, South Dakota, home of the Lodge Fish House Company. Our viewer video segment features Charles Hansen and another one of his fine presentations. Chef Kurt will lend his cooking magic to our show. Stay tuned. Prairie Sportsman's next. journey this week, our pal Ted Takasaki leads us on a tour of distinct builders, makers of the Lodge Fish House in Brookings, South Dakota. Hi folks, do we have a treat for you here today? We're here at Distinct Builders, the manufacturers of the Lodge Fish House here in Brookings, South Dakota. I've got here with me Bill Phelan, who's been a plant manager for six years now. Six years, Ted. You bet. And uh, we, we're going to be able to show you here how a fish house is actually made. It's really very fascinating. I never knew how a fish house is made before. And uh, I'm pretty excited about showing the folks around. So let's give them a quick plant tour. Uh, I think we should start right at the very beginning. The foundation of any fish house is the frame and the trailer. Bill, now that we're in the weld shop, the frame is actually the critical part of the fish house because if we're going to trailer these things for 30,000 miles or drive 75 mile an hour down the road, I mean, it's got to be built well. Can, can you tell us exactly how you start building these things? Yes, I can, Ted. Uh, all our frames are built by 2x3 uh, square tubing, 3x3 three three square tubing, 3x3 three three angle iron. Uh, they're all cut individual pieces. Uh, they're put into a jig welded by one individual that's worked here since day one. Uh, very, very picky on everything that he does. Um, a very, very fine frame. Now, once it's out of the jig and, and, he, and he's welded it all together, this is what we've got right here, right? This is a finished product here, yes, Ted. Now, the axle is really important, and, and you have a lot of real precise measurements to make sure that this, trail, this frame trails down the road perfectly, right? Yes. Uh, a couple years ago, we took that axle and we moved it ahead a couple inches, a back a couple inches, just to get the exact tongue weight on it. Uh, so it travels decent down the road. We don't have it swaying and whatever. And we've got to a perfect spot now where it travels very well, Ted. It's a beefy one too, isn't it? It's a two inch axle, it is, yes. Well, this looks a lot prettier here, Bill. And um, you know, it's important that these frames don't rust. What, what do you do to prevent that? Well, Ted, what we use is an epoxy primer and epoxy top coat. Uh, it's a special top coat that will eliminate a lot of the rock chips and rusting. It's a special paint that we use. 
This one's ready to be wheeled in. Put some wheels on it, right? This one's ready to go over in the other shop for production. You bet, Ted. All right, let's see what they do with it over there. Very good. Sounds good. Now, Bill, once the frame is done, it gets rolled into the shop here. I mean, this looks like a, a regular house being built. I mean, you know, it's, get, it's got all these wooden studs and everything else. I mean, what are they doing here? This is to a point, Ted, where we're uh, ready for the electrical guy to come in and pull his wires. Uh, we have the flooring put on, the carpet put on already. We got the holes in it, uh, all the walls erected, put up. We got the rafters in, the roof on. So we're ready to go to the electrical department and start pulling all the wires. Now, I, I noticed you got two by threes. Is that what you're using? We use two by threes in a wall, Ted. Uh, we use a, a three quarter inch tongue and groove on the flooring. We use two by eight rafters up there, and we use a a one-piece rubber roofing up on the roof. I, I suppose the rubber roofing is important because we don't want any, any water coming in. Right? Yeah, it's a one-piece rubber roof, Ted. It's got a 12-year warranty on it. Uh, very, very durable. It, it's a, a tough product. Now, once it's all framed in, you have to pull a lot of these wires, just like a regular house. And I think, you know, as far as you've got something called an RVI certification, I mean, that sounds pretty fancy, but I mean, really, what does that mean? It's RVI, uh, they're codes that we have to follow, Ted, uh, for wiring, for gas, for everything. Uh, the spacing of our wires in here uh, have to be a half inch minimum. We are at four inches. Uh, a 45 degree turn with our wires crossing each other from a 12 volt to a 110 to protect the consumer. Um, they come in thoroughly and, and check what we're doing, which protects the consumer from everything out in the field. Now, RVI, I mean, that's a recreational vehicle. Industrial. Industrial? Association, yeah. Okay, and, and so they're actually monitoring these, these uh, rec RVs so that it makes these things that much safer now safety issues yep like i said they they come in they test all our testing equipment our gas line testing equipment our electrical testing equipment making sure that we're doing things right and we just don't see issues out in the field ted with electrical complaints or gas line problems or things like that and that's what they are there for is to help us Now, what are they doing here, Bill? They're, they're actually putting some of the siding up? This is the point, Ted, where uh, they're gonna start applying our uh, aluminum siding. We're applying the glue right now. Uh, it's an epoxy uh, glue that we put on. It's a 3M product, very durable. Uh, we just don't see any issues with it, Ted. Okay, Ted, now he's bringing over a corner cap piece of aluminum that will be applied uh, it's a, a, almost a two-man job here. They got to get positioned just right, get the tape situated, the aluminum situated just right, because uh, once it's in place, it's in place for good, Ted. That's important that it stays in place for good, right? It, it's very important, <laughs> yes. <That's> important. <laughs> Now, Bill, we've got all the aluminum siding, and it's got, you've got a lot of different colors and this new camouflage pattern. That's pretty cool. And then all this fancy, shiny stuff on the side, and then you even put the wheels on when we weren't looking. So yep. what, what's the next step? Okay. We've got 10 different colors to choose from, Ted, including this camouflage. This is a brand new uh, pattern that came out in November. Very, very hot item for us. Uh, we put the diamond plate along the bottom, along the wheel wells, all the finishing touches on at that point. We've got the wheels on, so our next step from here, Ted, is to hop inside and do our insulating job, our spray-in foam. All right. Now, this spray-in foam here, it, 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 it's, it's kind of expensive, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it than just spraying it in here and uh, there, there's got to be a reason for doing this right bill yes it is a very expensive process ted um, we do it mainly because it, it weatherproofs your shack it keeps all the moisture out it keeps all the air movement out it just seals everything tight and it bonds the whole unit together and makes it much stronger that way per inch is an r value of four so in our two by three walls we have an r value of 10 in the ceilings uh, we have our two by eight rafters, so it's anywhere from 18 to 20 in the R value up top there. So that um, just makes it, it's a warm shack is, and, and airproof 
And I mean, you could roll this down a hill and tumble it, and it'll still stay together. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that happen before, but uh, holds everything together very, very thoroughly. Now, Bill, they're making this one look really nice inside. I see that you got some cabinetry and some paneling. Yes, Ted, this is a, a cabinet that's going to be put inside there. It actually is built at a cabinet shop just outside of town here, along with all our other cabinets, overheads, countertops, and things like that. Uh, at this stage here, Ted, they are putting in the paneling and starting to trim things out and install these cabinets that are built here. God, let's take a look inside. It looks really nice. Boy, Bill, this is really starting to look pretty, man. You know, what is, what, what's he doing here? Here, Ted, he's putting on the wheel well cap. Uh, again, it's made at a counter shop place outside of town here. Uh, we've got all the rough in uh, electrical poking through the walls. We can start putting outlets in, uh, electrical boxes, things like that. We got our, our dinettes partially built back here, Ted, ready to go. Looks like the inside of a log cabin. <laughs> Looks very nice, doesn't it? No doubt. Yep. Holy cow, Bill, now this is nice. Man, it is decked out ready to fish, isn't it? Yep, this baby's ready to go, Ted. Now, it must take, uh, I mean, how do you power everything? You got lights, every, look, you got lights on and over the fish hole, you got rattle reels, you got these little storage compartments and bunk beds. I mean, you can sleep in this thing. Yep, yep, it's just like home, Ted. This thing is powered by... Uh, a uh, cord that we can plug into shore power, Ted, or we can plug into a generator. Uh, they come with a converter in it that takes the 110 power and breaks it down to 12 volt. Uh, so it supplies 110 into your shack yet for bigger appliances, things like that. Also supplying the 12 volt power for uh, cell phone chargers, uh, cameras, things like that. Plus, at the same time, it also charges your battery system. So a lot of people run it for a couple hours before night and charge your batteries and get through the night with their charged battery. Now this has also got uh, forced air heat as well? Yep, there's a, a 20,000 BTU suburban manufactured uh, furnace underneath here, Ted. It's UL listed, it's a forced air, uh, very, very durable, very, very safe. It has a low limit switch, it's got a high limit switch, which also protects the consumer there again. Now this is my favorite feature right over here. That, that's, it's, got a, it's got a flat panel display television. Yeah, <laughs> it's a flat panel TV which uh, we have a stereo that plays uh, DVDs over it so you can watch your favorite movies here, Ted. Or we also have a camera plugged in here. Uh, when we get out to the ice, you'll see that work and we can watch the fish. Underwater camera. An underwater camera. See the fish. Yep, to see the fish. And uh, that screen will not be used, but we'll have it hooked up to here so you can watch your camera on a big TV here. Now, Bill, I noticed that there's some bunks and beds in here. Can you actually sleep on the ice overnight? Oh, absolutely, Ted. Is it is it pretty safe? It is very, very safe. We're back to the RVIA again um, with the, the gas line testing. Uh, every one of these appliances have been tested after we've had them put in. All our gas lines have been tested. All the electrical lines have been tested two times before going out the door. So we know ourselves, Ted, that these things are very safe. And anybody can go out and ice and enjoy a weekend or a night of sleeping. I noticed they got uh, smoke detectors even. Yep, we also have a, a carbon monoxide smoke detector, which uh, we have to do with the RVIA standards. We also have an LP regulator uh, detector over here in the wall also. Uh, it's set at a certain height off the wall, so if there is an issue with LP, LP settles to the floor, and, and that's where we'll detect it first of all. So what you mean by this RVIA or RV... RVIA. RVIA certification is that, I mean, it's an extensive checklist to make sure that every person who gets and stays in one of these things is absolutely safe. Absolutely. We have a five-page checkoff list. Ted, that uh, the first page is very, very thorough on the gas lines, the furnace, uh, the electrical issues where they actually have to sign their name off. The four other pages, it's very thorough on two other employees have to do a checkoff list, they can initial it. But everything in this shack has been tested, checked off, and make sure it works and is working properly. That's great. Man, I can't wait to go fishing. Now, Bill, I'm finding out that these fish houses are way more than fish houses. I mean, you know, you can camp in them in the summer. You can, outfitters and hunters can take them out and, and live in them in the fall. I mean, I mean, this one right here is, 
it's even like a portable office. Yes, it sure is, Ted. This one is actually going to the oil wells up in North Dakota. It's a, served as a, a living space. It's got an office space. It's got your refrigerator in there, a cooking area in there. Uh, still able to go to the ground. We can put holes in if they want to fish out of it yet, Ted. We can do whatever they want. Even construction guys on a construction site be able to use something yep. like that. This would be ideal for a construction site. Yep. Cool. Let's take a look inside. Very good. Boy, this would be a really nice office. And I noticed that you got an air conditioning unit in here and then also a door where they can pull their four-wheelers in as well. Yep. We also uh, offer on these uh, a ramp door, Ted, that folds down, easy to get snowmobiles, motorcycles, four-wheelers, whatever you have in the back door. Along with the AC, this AC also has a little heater on it, Ted, to keep somebody warm in here or help keep somebody warm in the wintertime. We thank one of our Prairie Pals, Charles Hansen, a native of rural Corral, Minnesota, for sending in this fine effort for our viewer video segment. These are the first ducks that, uh, some of the first ducks that came back last spring, right uh, north of the town of Corral in a flooded cornfield. In this particular scene, we have mostly shovelers and mallards, but there's a few gadwalls, and there are a few green-winged teal, and maybe a widgeon or two. In this part of the picture, we can see green-winged teal, mallards, shovelers, and uh, I think that's just about it for this particular segment. <clears throat> it was a very windy day and the ducks were out uh, foraging for food out on the corn stalks. There's some widgeon on the top of the photograph. There's a green wing teal on the top. Mostly it's mallards and shovelers. The northern shoveler is one of our most beautifully plumaged uh, ducks in the spring of the year. They take on the color later than most other waterfowl, so we seldom see them in good color here in the fall, but when they come back in the spring, they're something else to observe. Shovelers of come to the numbers that, uh, that we see nowadays and beyond, far beyond what uh, they used to be. They're not hunted that much because most sportsmen prefer to take something else. Sometimes they call neighbors mallards. Those hunters that do get them, uh, give them to their neighbors and maybe not their favorite ones either. But as far as a, a duck to look at in the spring of the year, they're almost second to none. Only the wood duck could probably be more colorful. One of the favorite food sources of the canvasback is wild celery. One of the primary uh, lakes in western Minnesota that holds a lot of canvasbacks in the, in the fall is Lake Christina in Douglas County. Most of the canvasbacks winter on the Mississippi River and then later into the winter they'll go further south as far as central and even southern Louisiana 
and uh, also a large segment of them go out to the east coast and winter in areas like Chesapeake Bay, parts of North Carolina, coastal North Carolina. Canvasbacks are over the water nesters, building their nests over the water in heavy reed, reeded areas of, of suitable habitat. One of the primary um, predators of canvasbacks is the raccoon, which has advanced further north in recent years and is found in areas of prime um, habitat, nesting habitat, and is one of the main reasons why canvasbacks uh, have nest failure. Canvasbacks are also one of the fastest flying of the waterfowl, having been, having been clocked at over 70 miles an hour. At one time, they were thought to be the fastest flying of all, all waterfowl, but since then, it's, it's, that honor goes to the red-breasted merganser, which has been clocked at close to 100 miles an hour. Hey, the beavers found something to chew on, and so did we. Chef Kurt's coming up next. Let's see what he's got for us. Hey, Prairie Sportsman. Today we're making a snack out here on the deck. We have something very special for you. We're making enchiladas. They're made from a corn tortilla, and we're using some advice that one of my fellow cooks, James, gave me. First of all, he said if you could warm up a little oil and put the corn tortillas in that oil, it'll help them from drying out, especially as you keep recooking them. Next, we're transferring over to Krista, who's going to roll them up. You'll see that she's got a little bit of meat that we had left from uh, several different shootouts where we had some small wild game meat there. So we've sauteed all that together so it's well done. Uh, we're adding a little marble jack cheese into that. That cheese is just lightly spicy. And then she's rolling that up. We've got a special sauce that James had created for us. Uh, James' sauce is kind of unique because he does it in a food processor. So you're going to need for this roughly half a tomato, half an onion, one of each bell pepper, a green and a red if you could, uh, peppers and uh, the ch chili powder. We need a tablespoon of chili powder. Now three tablespoons of cumin is kind of what flavors this sauce up that we're making. But you're going to blend all this in uh, some sort of blender or food processor. Then you're going to add a little bit of salt and pepper to it. And you're going to want to add a small bunch of cilantro, similar to what you see sitting right out here in front of the cutting board. You need that accent flavor. Once you've mixed all that together and blended it, you bring it to a boil and using a white roux, you're going to get a sauce that looks like this. That's the enchilada sauce. This is what will flavor this. However, right now we're just rolling up a selection here. So there's at least one for all of us. And at that point, we're going to sauce them, put them underneath the uh, heat here. And what we're after is we want that to uh, melt that cheese. Once that's melted, we're in pretty good shape and we don't necessarily have to worry about it. Looks like we're at the end of our fun there already. With that, we're going to make some room here. What do you say, Chris? Mm -hmm. She's got the last, that's the last one, isn't it? All right, we're going to sauce this and then we're going to put it on some flame. And we'll reserve just a little bit of sauce for later. So I'm going to give this uh, a row of sauce going across. I'll start heating this up. And you could put some sauce in the white dish there. All righty. There we go. She's hot and running. Now. We'll clean up our mess just a little bit here. We'll need a little sour cream on the side. We're going to take and chop up a little green onions here for color. Ah, yes I do. There we are. Put yourself a little blob there for us to treat us. OK, 
Okay, just a rough cut of the cilantro. Then it'll be green onions. We'll put that cilantro in a little pile, maybe right next to it. There you go. Okay, and we can hear that just the way we want it. See the cheese melting in there already, Chris? All right, that means we're going to take that out. They're happy, happy already. So with that in mind, we're going to go something like this. Oh, come on there, Kurt. He's messing that up. There he goes. Big save, big save. There we are. We don't want to waste a drop. Now we got to have a little green onion on there. Garnish that top a little bit. There. Just a little bit of that green onion chunks. Should be good as new. What do you think? Good. Looks good indeed. I think we got it licked, and we're going to be ready to snack on such a beautiful day. Hope you can find time to do the same. Give it a try. You're going to enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Well, we've come to the end of our time. We had a great time, and I hope you did too. And I hope you'll come back for another adventure with Prairie Sportsman. The local broadcast of Prairie Sportsman is made possible in part by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Econar, producing geothermal heat pumps in Minnesota for over a quarter of a century. Econar, the leader of cold climate heat pump technology. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Closed captioning for Prairie Sportsman has been provided by the Sertoma Clubs of Alexandria, Brainerd Area, and Wilmer, assisting people with hearing health issues and providing a service to mankind. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station.